everybody. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're reading the entire Bible together, one chapter at a time. We're in Isaiah 43 today. We're continuing this, this new section of Isaiah that's dealing with the perspective of the people in exile in Babylon. You know, we, we we're still kind of getting used to this. We spent 39 chapters and the big bad guy was Assyria. And now it's it's much later. We're dealing with the, the this situation of the Babylonian exile. And here you finally get in chapter 43 this specific and direct mention of Babylon. The enemy is explicitly identified here. And more than that, God's rescue from this enemy is explicitly put into terms. Here we really are getting this vision of the rescue of God gathering his people from the ends of the earth bringing them out of exile. But a chapter that has uh, some tricky uh, tricky spots in it here. Um, looking at the last couple of verses, it, are those really meant to be future tense? Are they meant to be past tense? Like how are we really making sense of some of this stuff? What's it talking about? Your first father sinned. Uh, there, there's some things in here that will need to be looked at and some questions to be answered. And so joining us today, We've got Pastor Matthew Worm, pastor of Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in Brookings, South Dakota. Good morning, brother. How are you doing? How are the people in Brookings? Good. We're doing uh, quite well out here. We've uh, had winter already and fall and and uh, and winter again and fall again. And uh, maybe <laughs> winter will come around and stick. But I like the fall weather that we have yeah. right now. It's good. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of the weather, we in Southern California had a, a weird summer's day earlier this week. It was uh, something like 94 degrees on Sunday. It was <laughs> really weird, but fortunately that seems to have gone away and we're, we're back comfortably. Um, I, I won't say what the temperature is. Now. I'm not trying to rub it in, but anyway, it's back to uh, no, that, seasonable that, that, temperature. That's fine. <laughs> it just makes me, you know, as we as we come upon the end of the church year here, and you know, especially in the lectionary that we have, you know, it's it's the end is near, the end is near, the end is near, and these you'll see these signs and and the heavens above and the earth beneath, and I think the weather is a sign of the end times. We are definitely in the end times, <laughs> but uh, it certainly can feel. But that anyways, way, yeah. yeah, Isaiah chapter forty three is I uh, got some wonderful words of comfort. Uh, you know, a, a lot of um, a theologians call Isaiah the, the Gospel of Isaiah or the Fifth Gospel or something yeah. like that. And then we have a good portion of that here in Isaiah chapter 43 for us today. Right, yes. Yeah. You, you get this real good declaration of, in spite of in spite of the people's sins, right? We, we saw that in Isaiah 42, you know, this description of just uh, I, uh, the people of God as the, the blind, deaf, servant, right? And we're still going to get some of that language today in Isaiah 43. But in spite of all that, we remember those last words you read in Isaiah 42, right? So he poured on him the heat of his anger and the might of battle. It set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart, you know, just condemning words, right? And mm -hmm. you're not expecting 43 then, to be really anything encouraging after that. <laughs> no, and there's great words of encouragement, but you know, Isaiah 43, and we'll get to that by the end of the hour, it, uh, it ends with, with words of, of judgment as, as well, and so you get, uh, but you get uh, good law and gospel, but I, I think I'd argue that, that uh, a gospel um, predominates here in this sermon of Isaiah 43 that we have for us. Um, I, I, would think it be okay so. I think so, I think it's some welcome relief. Yeah. It would be okay if I just kind of take a few minutes and uh, I think, think set in context uh, the direction I want to go with the discussion as you look at 43 today? Absolutely. Would you go ahead and open us up with a prayer and then just go right into that? Oh, I'd be happy to. Lord God, Heavenly Father, in your holy word, you name us. In your holy word, you tell us that you have formed us. In your holy word, you give us your Son, Jesus Christ, and through his servants, pastors and other Christians, you tell us that our sins are removed. And so, dear Father, keep us ever in the faith and grant us your Holy Spirit that we might be assured and strengthened for the days to come as we worship you and you alone. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Yeah. So go ahead and sketch this out for us here. Okay. So 
Um, I think I'll bounce on over to the catechism first. You know, catechism, mm. Luther's small catechism, the large catechism is a good way for us to, to understand a simple way to teach the faith, understand the, the deeper uh, good, goodness and richness of God's Word. And there's a lot of richness reflected in Isaiah 43 that we see, um, uh, or uh, uh, goodness reflected in the catechism. I think that comes from the, the roots of Isaiah 43. You know, the, the, the large and small catechism starts off with first commandment, you shall have no other gods, what does this mean? We should fear and love God, uh, or we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And these mm-hmm. a few chapters along here in Isaiah, Isaiah is going after idolatry. And uh, these idols of, of wood, of stone, who have ears but don't work, have eyes but don't see, and there seems to be this captivation, even though the, the Israelites are kicked out, they're exiled, they're in Babylon, but there's still this captivation of these Babylonian gods, and they think these Babylonian yeah. gods are more fulfilling, and these Babylonian gods are really going to be the trick, and these Babylonian gods are going to save. And, and so you get like this courtroom where the Lord brings uh, witnesses up and says, okay, uh, let's have a discussion here. Let's weigh. Well, what have these gods done? What do they do? What do they say? Do they know the former things? Do they know what's coming up? What, what are their actions? What's their power versus me? And what I've done, and you've seen me do, and what is coming up uh, in in the future, uh, and, and the great goodness that's going to come, of course, in Christ, um, and then in the eternal reality that He brings to us uh, in the resurrection of all flesh at at the end, and you know, as we get in, in John's revelation. Um, and so, in, in the large catechism, Luther kind of unpacks that first commandment, which talks about idolatry, and he says, you know, that in which your heart looks to for all good, that's your God. And, and, and so we break the First Commandment all the time. Um, but anything in life that you're looking to for, uh, for good is your God. And, uh, and, of course, exiles were, well, breaking the First Commandment, as, as all people do. And so uh, to, to bring the, the conversation and the relationship that our Lord has with his chosen people, the exiles here, uh, he gives them his name and his promises and uh, to, to draw them back to him so that they might seek all good from him, cast away these other idols, and, and, and rely upon him and yeah. his word, and call upon his name alone. Well, yeah, yeah and I think you're right. The, the idolatry, it, it, keeps, it keeps on being a theme. And the other thing I think, you know, that you know, let, lest we think to ourselves, like, man, why was this just so hard to understand? Like, just, just worship God. Why do they keep worshiping these other things? Like, were they... Were they that shiny or something, you know? Um, but we got to remember, especially in the context of uh, what came earlier in Isaiah, that this idolatry kind of came in through the back door by means of these military alliances. And, you know, back during the whole Assyrian controversy, uh, or crisis rather, you know, it was just a matter of like, oh, well, we, maybe Babylon will help us out of this one. Maybe Egypt will help us out of this one. And, and, and all of this maneuvering, politically was also religious maneuvering there was no taking on this alliance without them bringing in their gods when you're signing the the treaty papers and all of this and so god was showing again and again that their lack of faith in him by seeking out these alliances that itself was idolatrous and so i I feel like you got some of this language here in 42 that we saw it seems to be giving us this perspective, you know, back when it was saying there at the, what we just read at the end of 42, you know, he, he poured out his, his wrath, his anger upon him. It seems to be describing, this is why you guys got into this pickle. This is why you're in exile because you were doing all this, you know, flirting with foreign gods because mm-hmm. you were, you know, whether it was, you know, one moment Egypt or one moment Babylon or one moment Cush, it was, you know, you were doing all this stuff because you were trusting on everybody to get you out of the jam, except for me, and that's why this exile was necessary. Yeah, I'll, I'll get into the text here real soon, but one one little, uh, uh, I think, observation and, and way to understand this and apply this uh, this chapter is this, is that you know in the world uh, comparison is uh, the work of the devil. You know, so you. You know, you compare yourself, uh, you know, I'm a pastor, and I think, oh, that other pastor is far better than me, and, and before I know I'm all discouraged and I'm neglecting God's Word and prayer and the devil's got a foothold, or, or in marriage, right. you know, you compare yourself uh, to somebody else, um, 
uh, or, or you you compare your wife or your spouse to someone else and say, oh, well, that that spouse of that person over there who's not right. my spouse is far better. And then before you know it, you know, you're, you're headlong in all sorts of different kinds of things. Right. Or, you know, a kid in, in school, you compare yourself, oh, I'm not as good looking as athletic, smart, popular, all that other kind of kind of jazz. And, uh, uh, and, and we, we set our heart upon these, these fads, these things of like, oh, if I just, you know, get some more... Um, you know, uh, positive comments and social media, if I just get more friends, if I get better looks, new clothes, right. more tattoos, these things that I look to for good, then I'll be better. And that's not it. And so for all of us, as, as we struggle, as the devil gets into, comp- you know, causes us to compare ourselves to, to everyone else and our happiness in life and whatever it might be, um, he draws us back to who he says we are, who he is, and what he does for us so that we might find all contentment and we might find all joy in his word, especially his word made flesh, Jesus Christ, who, whose blood takes away the sin of the whole world. Thank, thank you, brother. That's, away. Yeah, that, that's really helpful because obviously, you know, we're not, most of us anyway, are not in this position of uh, making military alliances, right? That's, <laughs> that's, that's no. not necessarily the way that we're thinking about um, our day-to-day life in terms of whether there's idolatry in our hearts. But you're right. I mean, like, it really is a very everyday thing from whether it's, as you were saying, the clothes or social media or just, um, you know, or even in marriage or all these different things. Um, it, it is very easy to let envy get into our hearts. Mm-hmm. And, you know, envy, it's just, it just really is exposed as idolatry, um, as you were describing uh, very, very well, um, that it's just, it's ultimately because we're we're looking for something else to find our value and so that's why we just beat ourselves up over it as you put it um or we or we just can't be content with something because of yeah. that so i appreciate that application um we should as you said go ahead and dive into the text here it is uh, kind of a medium length chapter for isaiah um it, you know isaiah gets some pretty long chapters in here it's not one of those mm-hmm. But it is 28 verses, so we want to make sure that we make some good progress before our break. So let's go ahead and open it up here, read the the first several verses. So Isaiah chapter 42, this is the English Standard Version here. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen. I'm sorry, I'm looking at 42. It should be Isaiah 43. Yeah. I was I had Isaiah forty two pulled up because we we're looking at those last four, few verses. Oh, I read sure, that sure. before. Yeah, Isaiah forty three. Right. You mean he poured bit. on him the heat of his anger. Right. But no, we're, we are moving on. <laughs> forty three. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not. For I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So beginning and ending there with a creation theme, right? And that's something that we've talked about before, um, looking at uh, Isaiah and even different portions before that emphasis on the creation of Israel, the creation of Israel as a people, those those created and formed words, um, taking us back to, I mean, uh, the forefathers of, of the faith, taking us back to when God rescued his people out of Egypt. Yeah, there's nice bookends to these first seven verses. And, uh, and in the church here, we get this in season C, uh, in the first Sunday of Epiphany, uh, Isaiah chapter 43, 1 to 7. Uh, uh, great words, and it begins with these, these two Hebrew verbs for uh, creating and for forming. Uh, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, and at the end, whom I created for my glory, 
whom I formed and made. And so you get these, these beautiful bookends, this interwrapping, if you will, if you can like imagine God's arms, uh, his hands that, that do, the, do the work of creation, of formation, uh, mm-hmm. enwrapping his, his words of promise here. Um, and it's something that I think, you know, a lot of people these days, we're so technologically advanced, we, we don't uh, work with our hands as much as we used to. Roger in his book, uh, Benedict Option, he says it's good for guys to work with their hands. Um, and so if you do work with your hands, you know, think of it that way. You, you, you take pride in it and you, you, you uh, pour all of your attention into the, the details of what you're creating or forming with your hands. If you're working with wood or metal or some other project around the house or artwork or you know, anything like that. And what does he say to us here? But, but right away, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, your mine. And so imagine, if you will, his, his hands, the, the hands of the Lord, the God's hands, uh, enwrapping you, and then his mouth speaking to you. So, uh, you know, like the, a child in, in his or her father's or mother's arms, uh, but God, of course, is, is, is male, uh, uh, you know, being wrapped by these strong, uh, protective, creative hands of a father. They're always, you know, um, God's hand is out there for, for, for your good. Uh, and then he speaks, and he says, don't be afraid. Fear not. For I've redeemed right. you. I've called you by name. You're mine. Well, that, that uh, hand language there is what you have in the crossing of the Red Sea, that God stretched out his hand and parted the water, right? Like, you, you can almost imagine God, like, you know, taking his hands, right, and, like, with one hand pushing one wall and put the other hand, like, pushing the other wall, right? And other places, it's uh, the description is the breath of God, right? So it's this, um, th- there definitely is this sort of imagery of, like, God, you know, kind of like, as you were saying, like like a man who's like working on some kind of project, you know, maybe a, he's like woodworking and, you know, at some point you got to like blow off the sawdust or something like that, like with your hands and with your breath. And uh, that these moments of God, of God saving, of God creating his people, um, I mean, they're, they're creation moments. So they're, the language is very similar to Genesis and that the one who saves is the one who has created. Yeah. My uh, first call I had out of seminary was to Trinity Lutheran Church in Bemidji, Minnesota, and there's a wonderful gal there. Her name is Kathy Kipley. And for every baptism we had at that church, uh, she would make a little banner, and she mm-hmm. would uh, hand-stitch the child's name, full name, uh, into this little banner, and would hang it there by the baptismal font when we have the baptisms. Yeah. And what verse did she hand-stitch onto that was Isaiah 43, verse 1. I have oh, wow. called you by name, you are mine. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the Lord's blessed us with a bunch of kids since since then, and she's graciously made these banners for uh, for our children. I've called you by name, your mind. And so we have this up as as a as a reminder all over in our house, in our kids' bedrooms, and on their doors, and so forth, that uh, that that this is God's name upon you now. Now, so if you ever ask like, who are you? You know, who am I? You, you, the devil gets in with envy, and you start comparing yourself and say, well, this other person's got better stuff than me, and I don't like what God has given to me, and and, 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 and his name upon me, and you start, you know, uh, desiring these, these other things and this idol worship, if you will. Well, there's this reminder of, of this verse of Isaiah 43. I've redeemed you. I've, uh, I've put my name upon you. In holy baptism, the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit rests upon that baptized child, upon that person. And the devil can't have them because the Holy Spirit has entered in, and, and Satan has been kicked to the curb. And mm-hmm. so so that's how this starts off. And and God does, you know, uh, you know, in the New Testament with with Jesus's institution and of baptizing, say, go baptize. Um, we, we get His name upon us there. In the Old Testament, God's name was was upon them through this covenantal relationship, and, and Isaiah is reminding them here through the Word of the Lord that uh, there is this covenantal relationship. Though you have turned your back on God, though you've gone after these other idols because you've envied your neighbors and whatever right. else, still, still, I'm I'm your God. Right. So, I redeemed you. Fear not. I've called by name. You're mine. And right. so God, says, God's you know, renewing His commitment, right? Like even though you you haven't fil- fulfilled your end of the covenant, I mean, like mm-hmm. these words, right? They're they're words of promise. You know, I will say to the north, you know, or um, you know, I will bring your offspring from the east. God's making all these commitments, all these promises to. I mean, I mean, this is a this is a description of. I, I know we need to keep moving on here, but like just to kind of make sure that we're making good understanding 
of this second part of the verses we read. This this sounds like a description of of bringing the people out from all the places they've been scattered because they were scattered after Babylon came and invaded, right? Yeah, and uh, and the Lord goes around and He calls them back. And if you can think in your head, you like a little two year old. He's got his toy or her toy, and he's like, mine, mine, mine. Everything a toddler <laughs> you know looks or sees or wants to have, it's in their mind. It's it's theirs. It's it's mine. Right. And so there's this jealousness of God uh, for His scattered chosen ones, His scattered mm-hmm. children. And, right. and so He's going back. And, and how's He do it? Well, He calls them through the Word, through the mouth of the prophets, uh, through Isaiah here. And then in verse 2, um, you, you kind of get this imagery of remembrance of you know, passing through the Red Sea, of going through the Jordan. And, and you mentioned about the, the hand of the Lord, you know, at the Red Sea there. And, and you had right. the pillar of the Lord before, the pillar of, the Lord, of, of, of cloud behind that separated uh, um, uh, Moses the, the from Israelites the army of Pharaoh, from, right? Uh, from the army of Pharaoh, Pharaoh as they were approaching. And, uh, and so God is right there, obviously, with his chosen people, as they pass through the waters. Likewise, uh, 40 years later, uh, the priests carrying the ark dip their toes in the water right. of, um, of the Jordan River, and the water stands up as a heap, and then the priests go in the middle of the river. And, uh, and all the host of, of uh, Israel passes on by his presence, his name there in the ark. And the waters did not overwhelm, although in both instances there's walls of water. Uh, the Red Sea on both sides, Jordan River, you know, up the ways there. Uh, mm-hmm. And so you weren't overwhelmed. Uh, and then kind of it, it stays with that uh, little analogy about walking through the fire, you shall not be burned. The, the flame shall not consume you. Why? Verse 3. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now what's significant about this verse is um, uh, this is the first time that Yahweh is identified as Savior here uh, in Isaiah. And, and so this is the... The, the, the working of God, this Holy One of Israel, yeah, well, what's he do? Well, he's your Savior. And, and so that's the, um, the, the, the interaction that his chosen people have with him. Like, he is the one whose hand is always there to save. Now, he does judge, of course. Um, right. But, but he, he desires to save. Well, yeah, and, 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 and part- I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, too. I was just, I was just, if I can just jump in really quick, that word Savior, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's the word that, that means uh, not just, you know, like someone who, um, I, I don't know, like does good things for you, right? But it's the person who right, rescues you, the person who defeats your enemies for you. I mean, it really fits nicely with what you were just describing for us, um, you know, reminding us back of, you know, that these words are evoking the exodus from Egypt, that this is the God who defeated your enemies and took you out of the Red Sea and left them washed up on the banks of the Red Sea in the morning, right? And so, I mean, in the context here, this is this is very gracious because God's saying, yeah, it's true in 42, right? It's true that you guys, you were going around making these alliances, being idolatrous, and you were punished. I mean, this is the exile, right? But he's going back and he's saying, but remember, before all that, I made these commitments to be your God. I created you. I saved you from Egypt. All this bad stuff that's happened since then doesn't negate who I am and that my name is on you. And, and there's so much more, um, you know, in in these uh, verses here. And I appreciate the way you've broken down these first three verses for us so thoroughly. We do need to make sure we read at least the the first like half here before our break. We only have a minute before that. Let me go ahead and just read. Just to point, I put it out there on the table here, this next little chunk, and then we'll actually have a chance to talk about it when we get back. Um, so let's pick it up here at verse 8. This is just following what we read, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. This is verse 8 now. Bring out the people who are blind, yet have eyes, who are deaf, yet have ears. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right. Let them hear and say it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Also henceforth I am he, there is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? 
Uh, pause right there to go into our break, but we'll talk about these words here on Thy Strong Word from Isaiah 43. We'll be right back. This is Dr. Dale Meyer. Have you heard Concordia Seminary's program, Word and Work and Intersection? Every week, you can hear it on KFUO Thursdays at 2 p.m. Central Time. We visit with many interesting guests about how the Word of God applies to their daily vocations and ministries. Be sure to tune in, and may the intersection of Word and Work be busy on your corner. Hi, I'm Pastor Mark Hawkinson, host of Moments of Assurance here on Worldwide KFUO. Coming up on the next MOA weekend program, I'm going to be sharing thoughts about heaven. What is known about it? What is not known? What do you and I have to anticipate there? That's heaven on the next MOA weekend. Coming up this weekend at 7.45 a.m. Central Daylight Time here on Worldwide KFUO, the messenger of good news, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. The story of Worldwide KFUO is a tale of technology. Radio was new in 1924 when KFUO was born to serve Christ the Savior. Now, KFUO is still finding new broadcast technologies so we can spread the gospel to the world via the web, smartphones, tablets, and new intelligent speaker devices. And when the next big thing is unveiled, we'll be there too. Broadcasting the good news at the forefront of technology, we are Worldwide KFUO. Welcome back, everybody, to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 43, and we're joined today by Pastor Matthew Worm, pastor of Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in Brookings, South Dakota. We just read before the break here these verses from 43. We read verses 8 through 13, and, and it's an interesting turn here. After the first portion, which emphasized this idea of, you know, you are my people, I've put my name on you, I created you, I formed you. And Pastor Worm was, um, you know, pointing out that the, that's that's language of like, you know, using your hands and using your breath. And, you know, this this image of like a, an artisan, you know, where the craft crafts uh, craftsmanship, the work of God here. After this, there's this turn. And now the focus is on his people as blind and deaf witnesses which is uh, <laughs> a little bit ironic, right? You're, you're my witnesses, but you're blind and deaf, and so I don't know how good of a witness you're going to be. There, this is a very ironic section here in the middle of it all. There's this script, There's the, these words, which I think are pretty key. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. So using that formation language and saying, there was no God before me, I'm the one who formed you. So taking a look at these words here, if you have a question uh, on these words or any, any part here of our chapter today in Isaiah 43 for me or Pastor Worm, give us a call. If you're listening live, you can call 1-800-730, pardon me, 730-2727. Or if you're in St. Louis, you can call 314-821-0850. Or you can always send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. So, yeah, so Pastor Worm, so what do you, what do you make of this, this next section here? Because we do have to like keep a pretty good pace here. But just kind of like looking at it overall, this, this section here, um, it really is this change, kind of this witness language. And you mentioned it, I think, at the start that um, in the previous chapters, there was the kind of a courtroom witness kind of scene. It seems like that's being brought up again. Yep, and it, that is, it's, uh, I think the imagery, you know, when, when you read a lot of the Old Testament, uh, Isaiah, and certainly the Psalms as well, you've got to let your imagination go. And it's good to have radio programs like this and further studies so you know and can understand more of that. Uh, but I've got to step back just a few more verses. I'm sorry about this because it's just too good to let pass. Um, back there in, in, in verse 3, and then you get to verse 4. Because he says, Because you're precious in my eyes and honored, I love you. 
This is the only time in Scripture where God speaks of his people and says these three words that men find so hard to say. <laughs> I love I love you. Now, the phrase I love you is, you know, all throughout the Psalms, Lord, I love your law, I love you, I love your works, yeah. uh, I love the things that you have done. Um, Peter, when he's reinstated after his denial of Jesus, uh, in the Gospel of John, he says, Lord, you know that I love you. And so these are the expressions of of, of us, the chosen ones, the baptized, mm-hmm. saying, I love you, back to God. But this is where he says, only place where he says, I love you, to his people, to you. And and so if you're thinking imagery-wise still here, it's it's the Lord's hands have made heaven and earth, enwrapping you, speaking his name upon you, saying, you're mine. And as you are enwrapped in his love and his promise and his, his gifts of, of hands to you, of course you're probably... In, you know, looking to him for all good at this time, he speaks these words, I love you. And so if you think of it baptismally, like sometimes you think, well, does God love me? Well, you look at the cross, and that's his son on the cross and not you. So evidently he loves you more than he loved his only begotten son. So that's a lot of love. Um, Where else do you see and are assured that God loves you? Well, through his word in baptism, where his name comes upon you. And here with this connection to Isaiah 43, uh, you, you get these great words of, I, I love you, you're mine. Then right after that, he says, well, but, but you guys have been going around to all these other idols, and their mm-hmm. their hands do nothing, their mouths do nothing, their eyes, they don't even see. And, and why are you looking for good from these idols? And then you get the courtroom um, kind of scene here with, with verse 8 and and following these these idols who are, are deaf, the people who, fo- who follow them, uh, they have eyes who don't see, um, uh, they're deaf, but but have ears. So, so let's get together. Gather all these these idols, these nations. Come together in, in a place and tell me, uh, tell me what they have done in all of their time. You know, the thing about it is, is idols are demonic, right? And the devil, he's got power. Um, but the good news is, uh, he's bound. He's uh, like Luther says, the the devil's just but a a dog, a raging dog, um, barking dog. But he's on a leash, and so the Lord only lets him go so far. Uh, for the devil is still the Lord's devil. Um, and so the devil's got real power, and idols, you know, do have real power, but uh, 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 but they have nothing compared to the Creator of heaven and earth, and, and Christ, who who puts uh, all of his enemies, all these idols, as footstools underneath his feet. And so then, in verse ten, uh, the courtroom kind of thing goes now to to witnesses, and and when we think of witnesses, maybe our mind goes over to uh, uh, Acts chapter one, uh, where, where these are. Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and, and all the world. And then our mind maybe thinks about the early martyrs, you know, the witnesses of, of the early church who who spoke God's name, who would not uh, denounce God's name, uh, blaspheme his name to save their own skin, their their own life. Um, and so now he says, okay, you, you people, since you, you're my chosen ones and you're listening to me, hopefully, uh, now you're my witnesses, and so you are to go and uh, make known what I have done. Uh, there's no other God who is formed, and there shall be none, none after me. And then in verse 11, you get this this uh, re- repetition of a pronoun here that gives us I, I right. am the Lord. Uh, and that, you know, might reckon us back to uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, where the Lord says, I am the Lord, your, your God. Uh, and again, we get this word here of... Uh, um, of the Lord being the Savior. There's no other Savior other than, than Him. So cast all these idols uh, of wood and stone and everything else, whatever right. your heart is looking to for good, cast it aside and, and remember well, your What complements the, yeah. I was going to say, it complements the point you're making about I love you. And I, I am glad that, I think that was worth going back a, a minute to, to take a look at, because you're right. I mean, it is a very unique expression here. And you get you get these words, and even even in Hebrew, it's kind of interesting that, you know, you don't always have the the subject explicitly put there with the verb, but there it is. Like I love you, um, mm-hmm. very very explicitly. And and someone might ask themselves, well, gosh, if God loves it loves us so much, why is it so f- hard for Him to say that more than like one time in the Bible, right? Um, <laughs> you, you you mentioned that you know it's hard for men to sometimes say that, right? And like you know, and, and yeah. sometimes women are like, why is it so hard for you to say that? Why don't you say it enough, right? Um, it is it is interesting. I think we've talked about this a little bit before in the context of Isaiah that the, the, the love language, as you mentioned, 
it tends to be the language of alliances of, um, you know, like, you know, I am like allied with you or aligned with you. And so you can kind of imagine why that sort of metaphor ends up on the lips of people more often loving God saying, you know, I, I have put, you know, turned my back on these enemies and I am throwing in my lot with you. Oh Lord, I love you that you could see why people would say that very often but maybe not God so often. But here I think you've just um, really kind of cracked this open for us, that in this context, God's saying, hey, look, n no other God is doing this for you. No other God is, is gonna actually going to bring you out of exile. Th there's, there's no one else. Um, who is going to love you? Who is going to take care of you? Who is the one who, who seems to be for you, since it seems like the whole world is against you? Well, it's me. I'm the only one. I'm the one who's going to love you. Like, I'm the only God there is, period. So, I mean, just, I think it really complements what you were just um, pointing out here. These these words, like, you know, besides me, there's no savior. Uh, I, I think that in the context, the, the God's saying, I love you, to say, I'm the only God who's going to take you out of exile. Yeah, and and and, uh, and so hopefully they should should listen to him, right? But that doesn't change you know, the <laughs> Lord's stance and his posture towards towards his people. And you know, we might think of um, the parable of the prodigal son, for instance. You know, the son mm. leaves his father and pretty much says, "Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance now, right. because I don't, Father, I don't look to you for good. No, I look to uh, the world for good." And so right. he squanders it all on what the world says is good. You know. Uh, the lusts of the flesh, and so forth. And then, he's like, and then he comes to his senses, and he comes back to his father. And his father runs and wraps him, puts new clothes on him, kills a fatted calf, has a feast. And because his son that was dead is now alive, um, he's found. And, uh, and that parable, I'd argue, is about sonship. It's about uh, the place that we have um, because the father's name is upon us, because we're baptized, mm -hmm. because of who yeah. he says we are, um, regardless of, you know, even if we turn away from him and seek after other gods, it doesn't change his stance. So so we, you know, in the Psalms say, well, yeah, I love you, God, because, and i got to say this to you, because my actions three seconds ago uh, showed that I didn't love you because I loved myself or the right. lust of the flesh more. But now I love you again. Okay, good. And, and he loves to hear that. I mean, that's why we say I love you to the to people we love, because they love to hear it. And, and so the Lord loves to hear his words that he's spoken to us back, spoken back to him. And he says, I love you you of course he loves to hear that we love him back and that's what we do in our hymns of praise and our lives of of love and service towards our neighbor too very good uh, we, i was going to say one more thing um or, yeah. or, or rather uh, ask you if you wanted to add maybe one more thing we do need to move on to the next section but if there's i, I know it's, it's it feels like i'm just being like a slave driver no, here no, but no, if no, there's no, that's, one that's thing <laughs> about this this section we just read maybe uh, yeah. if you could you kind of do that one more, like one more thought or observation, yep. and then we, we need to pick sure. up the rest of the reading. Yeah, uh, uh, verse 11 is, I, I am the Lord, besides me there's no Savior. And then if you go over to verse 25, which we'll get to in a few minutes, he says, I am he, and then he says what he does. So verse 11 right. is his name, mm -hmm. Savior. Uh, verse 25 is is what he does. And so with that, we'll, we'll move on to the next section. That, that's really good to, to keep in mind that you have those little, sometimes those little hinges, I think that that is one of them that you just need to kind of hold on to because the other shoe is going to drop. So mm -hmm. here, here we go. Let's pick it up here with verse 14, the next, like the third little uh, section, the third quarter of it here in Isaiah 43. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans and the ships which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise." 
So um, here, here we go. It's back to that language, the, the people whom I formed for myself, right? My chosen people. And um, again, it seems like we're going back to that language of the Exodus, right? I mean, making a way in the sea, a path in the waters, bringing forth chariot and horse and army warrior. We're, we're just going back again and again to that saving moment where God not only rescued them, from Egypt, but that was really the moment where, in many ways, he he formed them to be his own people. Yeah, and in the latter half of verse fourteen, you know, the Lord's name is there, and He's the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And then, for your sake, so exemplifying His love, showing it, um, he he then uh, gets rid of the, their their oppressors, yeah. and so the Babylonians now are are the fugitives; they're the exiles instead of the, the Israelites. Uh, who have exiled, and, you know, they've been led away in chains, they've been captives. Um, you know, Chaldeans and their big slave ships and so forth uh, that they rejoiced in. And uh, uh, and so now there's this reversal of this uh, mm -hmm. at the Lord's hand, because he's the Redeemer, right? He's the one who, who, who buys back, and he's the one who saves. He's the King, the Holy One, uh, the Creator, uh, your King. And so um, 16 and following there, he talks about... Uh, Makes a way in the sea, path of mighty waters, cheered horse, and so forth. So bringing back the Exodus kind of of imagery and so forth, and how uh, Pharaoh and his whole host drowned in, in the Red Sea. So uh, these fugitives now, who are the the oppressors, uh, the idolaters, um, they are going to be, you know, cast down along with their idols, and they will be extinguished uh, like a wick. Verse 18 is, uh, it, it's not like, when it says, remember uh, not the former things, yeah. uh, nor consider the things of old. Because isn't he not, asking them to remember the former things like the Exodus? <laughs> yes. But, but, it, it, but what he's saying here is you've got to read it together paired with, with verse 19, so this new thing that he's doing. Mm -hmm. Now it springs forth. Don't you see? Don't you perceive it? Like right. a way in the wilderness and, and rivers in the desert. So he's saying, uh, though what I did in the past was good, was great, of course, um, but but something better is coming. Um, my hand of deliverance is uh, is mighty to save, and it's done it in the past. But uh, but you, you look forward because something newer and greater is coming. Right. Now it springs forth. Don't you perceive it? And and that um, is then fulfilled, of course, in in Christ. Um, uh, John chapter uh, fourteen verse four. Jesus says, uh, I gotta pull it over here. Uh, four, four, no, John 4.14, 4, it is. Um, uh, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. And the water that I give him will become in him a spring of, of water welling up to eternal life. And so, so Jesus says that, well, it, it's me. And in, in Revelation, uh, it, he's the one of the, the river of life, and with him there will be no... Uh, no more tear, nor crying, nor pain, for the old things have, have gone away. The Lamb at the midst of the throne is going to be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And so this new and, and better thing that's coming is, of course, it's Christ. Now this verse gets abused, oh, terribly abused. I, I dis, dislike how it gets abused. Um, oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago or so, I was mm -hmm. up in Minnesota, and it's the land of you know 57 varieties of Lutherans, but the ELCA is a pretty big one up there. And they had their uh, uh, nationwide assembly where they thought it was a good idea to approve homosexual pastors. And, mm. and, and the verse that they celebrated, uh, this, this change in, in practice, was this verse. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Mm. Now it springs forth, don't you perceive it? And so this uh, liberation of, uh, of homosexual acts, even for pastors, was, was touted as like a Christ-like kind of act. Uh, which really goes yeah. against the whole of the rest of Scripture. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so, but I think we just have to think this this verse alone, it, it points to Christ, the, the yeah. ultimate fulfillment in, in the, Him. And not get distracted by the following verses about jackals and ostriches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, re I really appreciate that application you just made, because, I mean, it's, it's it really is something that, it, it, I think it's not 
when he's speaking these words of God for God here, he's not saying like I'm gonna. Well, you know, I, this is how I used to operate, and now I'm gonna do something. I'm, I'm throwing away the old rule book. I'm gonna do things a different style. This is the new me, right? Like, it's not like God's turning over a new leaf or something. But as you said, this is that language of you know you had this in the past, but now this is even greater. Or you, you mentioned John four. We can think of uh, you know John six where. God uh, or Jesus, our Lord, says, you know, your fathers, they ate manna in the wilderness. Well, here is the bread of life. Um, your fathers died. If you eat this bread, you have eternal life, right? It's that idea of, mm -hmm. you know, there was the old thing, but here's a new thing that's so much better. And and, and um, the irony, though, is it's so much better because it's so like the original thing, <laughs> But it just does the original thing even more, right? And so it's not like it's it's uh it's it's new or springing forth uh, because it's like really different. But in some ways, it's it's because it's doing the original uh, intent um, better than it was ever achieved in the past. And so it's this, it, it's not as if the Exodus was bad or like God's not going to do something like the Exodus. And it's just that rather the opposite. He's going to work an even better exodus. This is really the exodus. This is the exodus on steroids. It's just even more exodus when he brings his people back from all over the corners of the earth, from Babylon, uh, not just from the this incident at the Red Sea. Yeah. Well, we have some other good verses here towards we the end. Do. I bet time's absconding from it, us. It is. It is. Well, we will unfortunately have to leave the jackals and the ostriches be for just a minute. <laughs> uh, we have had good. a chance to look at similar passages in Isaiah, thankfully, so um, we can, can consider those um, at another time. But let's take a look at the last portion here of Isaiah chapter 43. So we just read through verse 21. So here it is picking up. This is the final quarter of the chapter. Verse 22, yet you did not call upon me, O Jacob, but you have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense. You have not brought me sweet cane with money or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you've burdened me with your sins. You've wearied me with your iniquities. I... I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us argue together. Set forth your, ca set forth your case that you may be proved right. Your first father sinned, and your mediators transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary and deliver Jacob to utter destruction and Israel to reviling. So, yeah, like just like you were saying at the beginning of the hour, um, you know, it, it definitely lots of words of gospel, right? And you have that um, definitely in spades here, right? You know, it's just uh, God saying, you know, I'm the one who for my own sake blots out your transgressions. I won't remember your sins, right? Um, but yet there is this note on the end of uh, your, your first father sinned, your meteors transgressed against me, I'll deliver Jacob to utter destruction. So, um so what 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 do you think is going on here with the the shift here at the end, moving from like the forgiveness back to this mention of the first father? Well, they're still pining after these other gods, and so uh, you know um, we could talk about it homiletically or, or whatever. And is it do you need to end every sermon on the gospel, or, or some sermons end on the law? I, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But so yeah. so it's just a warning to to look for all good from God's hand, to remember Him, and uh, uh, and. If you're going to remember sins, yeah, remember the sins of your fathers and how they transgressed, and and don't do it, right? Uh, learn from their mistakes and um, and and live uh, how God desires you to live in in order and in vocation now. Uh, right. A few couple of things about the first uh, chunk of this section here. Oh, yeah, it sure. talks about we wearying and so forth. About, right. Um, so verse 22, 23, 24, uh, 22, the people become weary of Yahweh. And so it's like, oh, God, oh we're worn out with God. Uh, and then he says, well, I didn't make you weary. Um, it, was, it was you that wearied yourselves. And in fact, now you've made me weary. Uh, you wearied yourselves. Uh, by your um, hypocrisy and your offering and sacrificial system that you've you know, neglected and, and, and polluted. And now you weary me with your iniquities. 
Um, mm-hmm. and, and so think of it this way, like, uh, we got a bunch of kids, uh, at home and if, if I don't take the garbage out every day, if my wife doesn't do the laundry, <laughs> if I don't do the dishes, it just piles up and piles up and piles up. Right. And before you know it, you got a pile of garbage, pile of dishes, pile of dirty laundry, and you're just wearied. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, it's because why does that pile up? Well, no one's taking any action to cleanse it. You might, you know, identify the problem, identify the sin, but if it's not cleansed, it just piles, it piles up. And so that's why we need to hear the holy absolution time and time again. You know, divine service starts out, name of the Father, right? His name's upon you. What's he do? He absolves you. And in, in instead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. You get it in the Lord's Prayer. You get it at the Supper. You depart with God's name upon you uh, once again into a world that's going to weary you. Uh, the wearying words are picked up again uh, by Jesus. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight and uh, to thirty says, "Come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I'll mm-hmm. give you rest." Or weary and heavy laden, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and hard, uh, or gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for my for your soul. So it's Jesus who who does. Verse twenty five. Verse eleven was the name of God. Verse twenty five of who he is. And then verse 25 is what he does. Right. And he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, I will remember, I will not remember your sins. The author of Hebrews brings that up two times about Jesus being uh, the high priest of a better covenant, uh, uh, the, the one who, who takes away sins and uh, remembers our sins no more as a fulfillment of, of Jeremiah chapter uh, 31. Now, why is this important for us? I think it's important for us because we have people who sin against us. Usually it's those who are in close relationship with, right, and sins pile okay. up. Uh, or maybe somebody has sinned against us, you know, terribly through, uh, through abuse, you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse, things, things like that. And we find it so hard to, to forgive and then forget. And, uh, but after a while, you know, I think that the Holy Spirit works, right, uh, and he works through his word, through the remembrance of his name and in his baptism. And so our, our image is, is conformed then to Christ. And, uh, and, and we, as we receive forgiveness, we become more Christ-like and joyful in giving out that forgiveness and more resolute in our hand of goodness uh, to those that God's put us in, in vocation with. And so this, this chapter you know, kind of wraps up here with the other bookend of, I'm your God, the one who wipes out your sins and doesn't remember them anymore. And my name is upon you, and you are holy. And may you, by my Holy Spirit, who I give to you uh, through the Son, uh, be given these gifts of the Spirit as well, and so that, maybe along the way, you can forget the sins against you as well, and just be happy, happy to forgive. Amen. We can only forgive because he forgives us. And so, yeah, just, I mean, the, these, um, like, I think what you said was uh, was very fitting that it does end on a, a word of warning. I mean, like our Lord himself, when he you know spoke um, those words written down in the gospel, he ended a lot of his uh, discourses with words of warning, right? So, but but that doesn't yeah. mean it's you know it's necessarily like negating the gospel or anything like that. It's just, it's just reinforcing it in many ways that, and, hey, look, I've forgiven you. Don't go back to the old way of not forgiving, of transgressing. You know, st- stay here with me. I love you. This is, I'm the only one who does. I'm the only one who can save you. There's no savior besides me. So we made it to the end of the chapter, brother. Thank you so much. Um, I really, I really do, again, appreciate you bringing out that, um, just that, that key verse in there. It, you're right. It is like this unique expression of God's love for us here. In 43, we are children of God, a beautiful image also of that baptismal banner. Thank you for sharing those things and helping us see how this really is the gospel here for us in the Old Testament here in Isaiah 43. Well, it's been a pleasure. And, uh, you know, the Word of God, it goes out and it accomplishes that which it uh, purposes, and, uh, and it does it. So, Amen. Amen. Everybody, Pastor Matthew Worm, pastor of Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in Brookings, South Dakota. Thanks for joining us today on Isaiah chapter 43. You know, um, I, I forgot to mention, you know, there at the end, you can take that as past tense. You know, God's saying, hey, look, I did all those things. I sent you to destruction. It was because I had to, but I'm the God who forgives, and I'm still willing to do that. Just because the exile happened, that doesn't mean I've forgotten you. That doesn't mean I've stopped being 
your God. And we see that in our own lives. Just because those things happen doesn't mean that God loves us any less. We thank our underwriters to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, lhfmissions.org. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. Until next time, to Thy peace. Strong Word, produced by the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate Office of National Mission in cooperation with Worldwide KFUO, the official broadcast ministry of the LCMS. Your support is vital for this program to continue. You can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Thy Strong Word.